Hey, everybody. It's great to be here today. I know we were originally meant to be live in Los Angeles in person, uh, but today coming to you from Alamo, California, which is in the East San Francisco Bay from my home office slash music studio. Um, it's great to be here to talk to you about product. Um, my particular topic um, is building the right thing for the right audience at the right time. Because that's all we have to do as product managers, right? Sounds easy, makes sense. But it turns out that is really hard to do. Let's just lay out for a minute what we typically look for in what I refer to as a product offense. It's gonna be in three quick parts. Part one, the basics, okay? First of all, most of us, most of us need to have a mission to draft on. And therefore a target outcome to deliver on that mission. Then a vision of what that might look like and a strategy of how it might be achieved. Within that strategy is ideally a point of view of where you wanna start and how that might lead to the outcome over time toward that vision. All makes sense, those are the basics. All right, part two is the team. In some companies, the product manager is the mini CEO, in which case you have to be the ringleader, the thought leader on all those things. You're the person that's looked to for the answers, the health, the status, the delivery, and the measure. In other companies, it's less clear. It's maybe more matrixed in a variety of functions. Either way, whichever your particular environment is, you need a cross-functional lineup of people that are complementary of another that can bring varying perspectives of the opportunity and the solution. While you as a product manager will orient yourself around the customer opportunity and the solution, design might draft on that and figure, figure out what it might look like and how it might work and how it might feel, right? Product marketing will help figuring out what are those markets to go after in order to win and how to even communicate with those markets. And what are those insights and what are those behaviors, those needs and those mindsets? Data analytics might offer um, help with measuring and indicators toward that success, right? And instrumentation. Engineering will offer, you know, the best te technical execution on how to get your way there and actually code the software in that case or whatever it is you're building. And if your thing, whatever it is, requires partnerships, I'm sure there's a business development team that could focus on bringing those target partners to the table and forge working partnerships. All right, that's a little bit about the team. Part three, alignment of mindset, goals, and incentives. Once you have your team identified, it's critical to ensure you're all gold the same way as you are. Incentives have to be aligned. There's nothing worse than when you're charged with, say, increasing engagement this semester by 10% whatever that might mean for you, right? And then your engineering counterpart is charged with standing up a new billing system over that same time period. Obviously, uh, there might be a little bit of Venn diagram over those two things, but you're not gonna get your win efficiently, if at all, if your cross-functional team have different mindsets. See, if everybody's working and operating in a silo, they think of their own day job as the center of the universe. And it's the difference between like nine people rowing in their own boats in various directions, right? Versus those same nine people rowing in one boat going in one direction. It's pretty clear which of those is gonna yield the most efficient path toward the right outcome. All right, now that we have a basic product offense established and sort of maybe understood, Many of us have spent years and years trying to push our own version of the product offense, myself included. But what happens far too often in search for our ultimate product management utopia, we burn cycles on the how for the sake of the what. When in actuality, the what is the outcome you were hired to achieve. See, there's not one universal product offense that rules them all. And if you can't get on board with that and figure that out, you're gonna die on the hill every time. It requires a few key tenants, but beyond that, it's really about flexibility and adaptability to the context and the circumstances and the environment you're in. 
Across the array of companies out there are so many variables that can help lead to that desired outcome. You might have a certain market opportunity or a funding opportunity or a certain strategy that's great or the best team, you know, an operating model. Maybe you have some IP. Maybe you're really good at data and infrastructure. Maybe your timing is great. Maybe your customer experience is impeccable. But even across those variables, you have to measure up against what stage the company might be in in its life cycle. Is it a new idea that isn't validated or funded? Is it maybe a series B stage company that's at an inflection point and is you know, facing a do or die with finite runway? Is it a later stage tech company that's extremely data-driven with big infrastructure where you can test into and measure anything you want? Or is it a 150 year old institution like a bank built on legacy technology and legacy business models that's striving for the digital tr transformation, right? So many variables and circumstances to get our heads around well before we can know which offense to run. In any case, you can't really know what to build until you can decipher the desired outcome your company or your investors or your stakeholders are looking for. I'll take you through a few different examples just to, just to paint that picture. I incubated a startup inside of a venture capital firm back in 2008. And this was at a time when we came awfully close as a society uh, to not being able to get cash out of the ATM with the crisis. And get this, at the time, we thought it might be a, a, a great opportunity, a great idea if working teams or even social groups could have real time threaded ways to communicate. A world where you wouldn't miss what you needed to know. Maybe a little bit ahead of its time. I'm sure we all use an app or two uh, like this today, but this is 2008. Anyway, this was called Threadbox. We realized we had some fit in the same quadrant as other consumerized enterprise companies that were beginning to thrive, such as Yammer, Zobni, Dropbox, Box. But they were all raising like 40, $50 million rounds of funding at the time. And uh, we, we had raised, I think, two or $3 million. Um, and we were gonna have to head there and go do a big round like that or take what we learned and, and sell what we had to an incumbent company. So in 2010, we sold Threadbox to MySpace. So we took our real-time group-based communication software, sold it to MySpace to collapse all of their groups and forums, mail and IM into one messaging layer. As a new part of MySpace, um, the outcome we were looking for was to drive recurring engagement through messaging and communication. And that at a time when Facebook was well on the rise. That required a particular offense. It required an offense that would gel with an incumbent technology stack. Anyone recall .NET? <laughs> that, that lots of our cross-functional team were really attached to. So due to that, we probably spent two months tuning our app for the MySpace application but four months creating an abstraction layer for our Ruby app to interoperate with their .NET stack, right? It took a particular offense to see all that through. Had we been really utopian about it and said we need to rebuild all of this on Ruby or nothing, um, we would have been thrown out of 407 North Maple Drive in Beverly Hills. And it would have been, would have been all for naught, right? I'll give you another example. Um, after News Corp sold MySpace, you know, they sold it to some ad tech, to an ad tech company, along with Justin Timberlake, I believe. Um, it broke our contract since we were acquired in the startup. And so we, we all moved out of Maple Drive at that point. And my team were thinking about building a new kind of consumption platform around co-viewing uh, of content. Um, it was called, I'm watching this. It's a great idea. Um, but every, everyone on my team, everybody was itching to do their own startup at that point. So we all kind of went our own ways. And I joined yet another joint venture in the music space called Vivo. See, Vivo was formed because 
there were tons of music videos being viewed on YouTube with no way for the owners of those videos, which are the record companies, to be compensated for them. So at the time, two of the three major record companies being Universal and Sony approached YouTube with a joint venture idea. The idea was to combine their catalogs of music videos, create Vivo, share and ad monetization on YouTube as those ads were displayed on those videos. So then Vivo built a, a website to establish its owned and operated properties because it didn't want to live solely in the YouTube space. Anyway, I joined Vivo in 2011. The desired outcome there was to build enough scale outside of YouTube so that we didn't have to solely rely on YouTube for revenue. And that required in and of itself a particular offense that would be compatible with the music industry appetite and patience and a customer experience that was maybe better or even higher quality than, than YouTube. So imagine me as the head of product and tech at that point, I'm charged with scaling Vivo across multiple services, web, mobile, connected devices into multiple countries and getting so many views that we could monetize on our, on our own. And I, I was very analytical in my pursuit there but I really had to adjust my offense to really account for the way the music industry works. For example, I might've determined that viewers view more and thus, and therefore we have more ad impressions if we employ our personalization algorithm and just play for people what we think they wanna watch. But a label relations person at Vivo might have a need to satisfy a label or even an artist by merchandising their video in a certain place at a certain time from an editorial perspective. You've got to imagine my dilemma when I know that Guns N' Roses might be your favorite band and you like 90s rock, and then I'm forced to instead put a Justin Bieber video there for you to watch first. Once again, had I been utopian about my offense, I would have at that time been run out of four times square in New York City. So I think the point here is adapt, be flexible, and find your bright spots. I'll give you one more example here since we're kind of working in threes. There's something about working in threes that works. Um, when I joined Goldman Sachs in 2017 to help build and scale an online consumer bank, the desired outcome there was to get just enough people to get a personal loan from us and just enough people to get a savings account from us, all while building the Apple card. That's the, the Apple credit card that is. On the personal loan front, I was kind of programmed to get people through a sign up or onboarding experience in order to give them the payoff that they're spending the time to go through it all, right? And it turns out that in personal lending, you don't really want to lend to everyone because if you don't lend responsibly, you end up holding the bag, so to speak. So it turns out, you don't really want so much a frictionless sign up and onboarding experience when it comes to a personal loan. You have to have the right friction in the right places at the right time. You want learned decisioning based on various criteria and thresholds. Anyway, all this while in parallel striving to be a back end banking partner for one of the most iconic brands in the world in Apple. Um, Goldman Sachs had, had barely been in the consumer business for long, much less established itself as a reliable banking partner. So it definitely took some reimagination of what a, what a card might be, how it might work, and how it might be differentiated, yet so simple. See, not every place you decide to work at is gonna be ready for your offense. So you need to figure out what of your offense will work and fast. And you need to be very clear about what won't work and then get to work on what will work instead. I guess what I'm saying is the first step to building the right thing is to discern and distill the outcome you're collectively after. Once you know that, you can lock in and start drafting from it. So to reach a certain outcome, you're gonna hypothesize what you need to build for whom over what period of time. You'll also propose what success looks like they're in. At this point in the movie, you're focused on getting X users or subscribers and getting them to spend Y amount of time or money for Z purposes, reasons, or some value exchange they're in. 
So now you have to break it down into what you believe are your best target customers and why. It could be that you've done some research and you've uncovered an addressable market to go after first, sort of a beachhead market. Um, and for one reason or other, you believe this is your best target to go after. They might be your best target because you have an, they have an affinity for your stuff, or at least an affinity for your kind of stuff that you're offering. In any case, you've got to believe that this is the North Star customer for you. Now that you've identified that North Star customer, it's time to dig into their behaviors, their needs, and their mindsets. This is one of the foundations for building the right thing for the right audience. Let me give you an example. Um, I love to provide the, the real world uh, case studies here. Um, once upon a time, part of my job at Facebook was to drive more of your time spent in newsfeed on public content. So this wasn't the cat pictures or pictures of the food you cooked. It's, you know, it's something like sports, music, entertainment, media, et cetera. So one of my teams, it was maybe seven or eight people on this team. They built a special app for celebrities to use on Facebook where celebrities would get insights on their posts and so forth. You see, in this case, there were two audiences, celebrities and their fans. All celebrities wanted to do was connect to their fans and all their fans wanted to do was connect with them. So we had this ecosystem effect. So when we unpacked their behaviors, needs and mindsets, it became a bet or a hypothesis that the winning, the winning thing might be here to induce a live video experience between celebrities and fans. In this case, we started with celebrities. So we tested our way into it. And I remember rolling it out to some celebrities. Um, and in those days, I think uh, The Rock was live streaming his workout from his personal gym on an iPhone. Um, Ricky Gervais was live streaming a comedy bit from his bathtub. And if memory serves, I think Chris Martin from Coldplay was playing um, Fix You, one of their big songs, from a piano in what looked like his living room, all over an iPhone. It wasn't hi-fi, but it was authentic and it was random, sort of last minute. And that's what resonated with the ecosystems between celebrities and fans. It sort of ignited both of them. Within a few months, um, management called for what they, what they called at the time, the live lockdown. So if you weren't work, working on live, now you were. And the live lockdown was all about saying, okay, we've validated that live is a thing through this celebrity fan connection. Let's let anybody go live in Facebook. And that's really how live streaming made its way into Facebook as we know it today. Let's not forget something critical here, um, the mission. All this talk about outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. It's gonna be the better of you to be drafting the outcomes behind a mission. And, and Facebook's mission, at least at the time, was to make the world more open and connected. Um, you could see how this ultimately drafted off of that mission, right? It wouldn't have happened probably otherwise. So that foundation is really critical. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about dialing in your product offense for the right circumstance, um, we've talked about what to build and for whom. Now let's get into what to build for whom over time, the over time part. The over time thing can be tricky too, because you don't want the over time thing to become over time. See, it turns out we as product managers can kind of see the future, but we've not always, we're not always sure of the future. So when, when you can, it's great to be able to build the smallest and least costly form factor of whatever it is you're after. Often referred to in the business as the MVP, the minimum viable product. It's great because we can put something in the market, measure its effectiveness and make ongoing decisions from there. But we don't always have that luxury. For example, when we were working on the Apple card at Goldman, um, we couldn't really ship a partially functioning card. And I was at Live Nation trying to work on enabling people to buy their tickets on their phones and use their phones to get into the event. You couldn't ship that partially. It either worked or didn't work, right? Meanwhile, in a lot of companies, you don't have all day. <laughs> you don't have runway forever here. 
Um, you need to make impact early and often. So this can become a really hard thing to calibrate. You have to ultimately be ready to, once again, adapt the product management utopia to the situation. So perhaps on the Apple card, the first version had a linear statement like every other credit card, but perhaps the follow on release might have a, I don't know, I'm making this up, a real time interactive version of the same thing, right? Um, maybe the Live Nation mobile ticket, you know, only services in their app uh, and maybe sits in your wallet in the next release. Also making that up. The point here is there's a way to apply this craft in any situation to drive the best outcome. And it's all relative. You just have to calibrate and apply. It takes a lot of IQ and maybe even more EQ, depending on what you're facing. It certainly takes a customer centric, um, an experimental and a bold mindset all at the same time. It absolutely requires alignment on the mission and that alignment isn't just with you and your fellow product managers, it's, it's your entire cross-functional team, at least like we covered off on a little bit earlier. Anyway, I think we're about out of time. Um, I hope you found some of this useful and I hope you have at least some incremental insight into building what matters for the right audience at the right time. Thanks for hanging out. I'd be happy to continue the conversation over some Q&A um, and let's connect on LinkedIn and Twitter and all of those things too. All right, thanks everybody.